Hi there, I'm Connor Wilson and I lead the schools and colleges practice at the Executive Search Firm Society. Uh, last week we hosted a webinar with a focus on the underrepresentation of black leaders in the international school sector. We recorded the session and I just wanted to provide some opening remarks to put it into some context. Um, it's been almost six months since George Floyd died on the streets of Minneapolis. Um, the video of his murder obviously ignited a global conversation about systemic prejudice and the disadvantage that faces the black community, not just in the United States, but all over the world. And for a while, the Black Lives Matter movement kicked even COVID-19 off the front pages. But the spotlight seems to have moved on a bit in recent times. And we're concerned by that because the issues that it felt we were finally beginning to talk about still haven't been addressed. Um, we hosted a webinar back in July, looking at the lack of black representation in leadership positions across all industries, but with quite a UK focus, and it was fascinating. Though I was reflecting throughout on the sector that my team serves, which is the global education sector, and particularly international schools. You know, these schools that serve really diverse student bodies and espouse um, internationalism in their curriculum, and yet are more often than not led by Caucasian people and usually Caucasian men. Um, as I sought to assemble this panel, actually, I found it worryingly difficult to think of black school heads, particularly black male school heads. So we just wanted to play a small part in keeping this conversation going. We envisage these webinars as being the start of a, a series, um, and we're focusing them specifically on our area of expertise, which is recruitment. I'm really grateful for the three panellists for joining us to share their perspectives. I'm going to introduce them in a second. A couple of things I just want to be very clear on. Firstly, our firm society is not holding itself up here as being a model of perfection. We care passionately about diversity, equity and inclusion and we talk about this stuff constantly. But we're part of the system that needs to change. Um, we freely acknowledge this and I'm here in this webinar with lots of my colleagues to, to learn as much as anyone else is. Secondly, we're going to focus the conversation primarily on developing understanding through the sharing of personal experiences of, so, uh, experiences of some of the issues and challenges that black people are uh, encountering, particularly in the area of career progression. We might stray on to some practical solutions, and if we do, great, but that's not the, the purpose here today. Um, mainly because our intention isn't to put, pe put the panellists on the spot. It's not their job to be fixing racism, to be ending employment discrimination, um, to be building more inclusive workplaces. That's down to, to employers and recruiters and hiring managers um, who are part of the system that's been perpetuating these obstacles. So with that, let me introduce our panel. Um, first up, we have Prosopina Dlamini Fisher. Prosopina is really well known across the international school sector. She spent seven years at the IB years ago, supporting diploma schools across Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. She comes from Iswatini in Southern Africa uh, originally. And she's led in a number of different schools, the United Nations School in New York, Strophoff International School, which is a three program IB school in Germany as well as being the Director of Education for the United World Colleges uh, for, for a short period. Um, Prosopina has recently rejoined the IB, and so she joins us today from The Hague. Um, she's known for her, for her passionate advocacy for meaningful student action and agency in international schools, and she's done a lot of consultancy on that subject in recent years. I was particularly keen for her to join us, though, today, because she has been quite a vocal, um, been, been a voice on some of these issues. She's written extensively on issues to do with leadership and diversity in the sector. And back in May, she wrote a piece for the TIE entitled Racism in Recruiting, the Elephant in Our International Education Room. Um, and I know that caused a lot of people to pause and think. Secondly, we've got Dale Taylor. Dale hails from the Canadian prairies, but she actually joins us today from Barbados, from where she's remotely running her school in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Dale has spent 25 years working in international schools in really diverse group of places, Saudi Arabia, Germany, Turkey, um, Bangladesh. She has degrees from McGill and the University of Alberta, as well as a doctorate from Concordia. She currently leads the Aga Khan School in Dhaka, and so she forms a part of this global network of schools run under the auspices of the Aga Khan Development Network. And last but not least, we have Rod Jemison. Um, Rod hails from the US, studied at Morehouse, a historically black college, and he started his career teaching in public and uh, private schools in Nashville, Tennessee, Marin County, and San Diego, in California. 
Um, he started his current role in 2013. He's the founding head of the United World College in Nagano, Japan. It's a pre-university boarding school offering the IB Diploma. Um, and his school has a really interesting mission. As part of the U UWC movement, um, the mission is to make education a force to unite people, nations and cultures and a sustainable future. Our recording jumps in mid-flow for Prosopina. What I just asked her was to um, comment on her reflections on this broad topic, but also explain some of the context around um, her writing that article back in May. So I hope you enjoy. Pertinent tie. Know that I write from the heart and I write from my experiences. And it was the ongoing, almost non-changing international space where over and over again, I kept missing seeing people who look like me in leadership in international schools. So not only had I worked in international schools, but I'd also worked with the IB previously. So I visited a lot of schools that were offering the IB program. When I was in the IB, I worked in for Africa, Europe, and Middle East. So that's where my schools were. And as I was visiting these schools, of course, many a time, I, if I was traveling with the male Caucasian, I was treated as the secretary, even if I was the boss. And the guys I worked with ended up having fun saying, oh, and this is my boss. And you laugh at these things when they happen, but it's totally unacceptable, especially because my name had been written in the letters saying we'll be coming and this is the job uh, that I do. I also realized that it's my responsibility, intended or unintended for me to share what I'm experiencing, but also to give others hope and inspiration because I am here because somebody somewhere decided to hire me as an African woman who was qualified to do a job, right? And I'd been through many experiences and um, jobs where I was hired as a black person for the wrong reasons. And I'd like to emphasize that I think it's important not to be hiring me as a black person, but to be hiring me as a person that's coming in to add value to the school or organization that I'm working in based on my experiences. So the experiences that I had had, some were amazing and some were um, not so amazing because I'd been hired for the wrong reasons. So you get the job, you get the so-called title within international education, but you find you're not being given the responsibility needed to actually lead the school. So that had been my, I think, burning desire to share thoughts and ideas and experiences with people out there. And having been a student, a child of diplomats, having experienced international education as a child as well, I also know that I didn't have role models. I finished high school traumatized that I hadn't really had any black teachers because in all the international schools I'd gone to, it was Caucasian people mainly that taught me. And I realized that the students don't get to experience having someone, a role model that looks like them to look up to, especially in international education. And the same thing with the teachers that we have out there there'll be one or two black teachers in a school but sometimes you know with that whole implicit bias they're not given the opportunity to rise within the organization because the schools are happy that they've hired them and that should be enough so they're not necessarily always given opportunities to do more and again i want to swing back to the fact that i am where i am because people did recognize that I could contribute to development of educational schools. I also wanted to highlight the fact that as I sit with my peers now, I've had diverse roles in schools, but I've never actually been a director or head of school. And this is not from lack of trying. And I got to a point where I stopped. And I think it's really sad that I did stop applying because I was exhausted, where I was constantly making it to the last three, the last two, and then getting excuses such as, oh, you're overqualified. Oh, we've hired the right person. And then as a candidate, when you hear who has been hired and you're making 
a comparison <laughs> with your experiences and your knowledge base, it's, it's shocking at times. It is shocking. And I just thought, okay, I'm well mature and over 50 now, and it's time to focus on continuing to do what I think is important, which is to uphold international education, to support schools. And if at this time it's not leading schools, then it's not leading schools. But so to just round off very quickly, Connor, I went there because there wasn't enough representation and I needed to share my story to encourage others, but also hoping that as I encourage others to apply to make a difference and to give students the ability to see people who look like them, then they'll share my story and talk about it. And I am happy that we were able to have discussions with different groups that I joined talking about the recruitment and really excited that society has taken it on and wants to continue the conversation because it is important and more of us need to be out there in international education. Thank you, Prosopina. I know that so many people were so thankful for you sharing your thoughts as you did in that article. And you touched on themes there, which I hope we can circle back to later in this conversation. Um, Dale, if I can turn to you, um, you've worked in parts of the world where female leaders, let alone women of colour, are a rare thing. I wondered whether, how do you connect with these issues? Well, it, it's been a very interesting journey for me. Um, I left Canada because of the lack of opportunities to get into public school systems and large public school systems. Also, I did study intercultural education and French is my minor. So I always had the aim of going overseas. And what I found were the, the blocks initially into getting into international schools, even as a teacher, was the, um, the barriers and, and the gatekeepers. And I, I do think that the way the international schools started and that sense of elitism and educating an elite group who would thereby go back to their own countries and enter prestigious universities created a, a, a culture whereby a lot of status was afforded these institutions and the kind of people that they wanted leading and teaching in these institutions were of a particular type, um, Caucasian male, maybe Caucasian female in some cases, but I don't think they were ever started in, in terms of the teaching and leadership to be inclusive. I think over time, the student population became more diverse, but the irony is, is that it was not reflected in the teaching body. And so the biggest hurdle again for me was getting into these organizations. And I still think that there are some schools in certain parts of the world that are still resistant for letting in, um, say, women, uh, women of color, people of color into the organizations to teach. But I, I was fortunate in, in that I was able to go to the Middle East and there, there seemed to be a lot less racial prejudice, you know? And I, I know that there are brown people there, there are different types of people there, but I always subscribe to the philosophy that push where it's easy. And so it was relatively easy to, go, to get into Saudi Arabia at a small international school there and I found the people there very, very welcoming. I think they were just very thankful to have international educators come over. Um, and so that was a challenge. And then moving on to my next position uh, was a challenge. And I think it was more around race than um, gender. I think gender came into place a little later when I was applying for uh, headship positions, okay? As a teacher, the, the challenge was around race. And I remember, if I may give a personal anecdote, that when I applied for a position in Kuwait, I went recruiting with a friend and there, uh, she was 
offered many, many positions, and I was just as qualified, if not more qualified than she was. Um, and it took her saying to uh, one of the directors of the school, I have a friend, would you, and I'm not coming unless she comes with me, all right? And so that forced them to take a, a careful look at my qualifications. But then when I was in the school, and when they saw what I was doing, what I was capable of, what the parents appreciated, what the students appreciated, I was able to move up quickly within the school to other uh, positions of leadership. But that initial barrier was very difficult to navigate and to move around. Um, so, so that was hard, but I was, a lot younger back then. I, I w kept going, wouldn't take no for an answer. And that I would say the people that I could possibly mentor in this position as well. Now, I, I wanna talk a little bit about the, the sexism I've encountered, and then I, I want to go back to uh, recruiting and, and talking about that and being on the other side of the table in regards to recruiting. So I, uh, I've been in, in, in countries since then, um, and I would say, I'll name them, uh, Turkey, Bangladesh, where I am right now, that are incredibly patriarchal cultures. And how that plays out is so different. And in schools, you traditionally have a lot of females, a lot of female teachers, and luckily they've been able to rise up into leadership positions. But it does create a tension where women are always judged more harshly or there are different standards for women than they are for men. And I remember when I started in Bangladesh and I, I called the first administrative leadership team meeting and um, the men uh, sauntered in late. The women were already there, ready to go, focused, uh, but the men were sauntering in late and they thought what surprised me is they thought they could do this. They thought this was acceptable. So obviously I, I challenged that right away, you know, but what was interesting is they were surprised I challenged it. And so obviously, you know, uh, very different cultural norms, very different cultural values. And yes, as an international educator, one must be aware of the cultural context you're operating in. But you're, also, but you're within another culture. I'm, I'm within the culture of an organization that promotes plurality, that promotes equality. And so those values need to come through in the school as well. Um, also, it, it's very challenging when you, you're very much aware for, for leaders, for teachers, and especially for students, that the male gender is the preferred gender. And so it's a lot of supporting of the, the, the female students that I need to do and, and building up their capacity and their confidence. And I'm thinking it's 2020, why do we still have to do this? 2020, when we're dealing with the internet of things, artificial intelligence, robotics, really highly sophisticated technological advances, and yet we're still at a base place, I would say, when it comes to race and when it comes to gender. But that we can't stop. The work needs to continue. And also, but, I'm Dale, if I, if I may, I'm just going to, I want to bring Rod in quickly, and then I okay. want to circle back to the things that you're talking about here, but just to get, get Rod into the conversation. Um, thank you so much. Um, Rod, what are your thoughts on this as an individual? I, I'm, kind of aware that you're working for a school where diversity is so baked into the mission and I wondered whether you might have had a different experience in any way to what you Prosecutor and Dale have explained so far. Thanks Connor um, and, and as, as both of uh, my colleagues said it, it, it's great to be here uh, this afternoon and appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak with all of you. Um, you know, this is my eighth year here in Japan, and actually my second stint. I was here uh, about 25 years ago um, as um, an assistant language teacher, uh, and I was located in, a, in the rural part, the northern part of Japan, actually very close to where the tsunami um, happened uh, years ago. 
Uh, and I, I'll never forget arriving that first day and, and um, you know, coming, uh, walking down the escalators at that particular time. And remember, 25 years ago, Japan wasn't even, you know, as, as, um, as uh, you know, populated as it is now by foreigners. But coming down the uh, escalator and, and the kids looked up at me and said, oh, Shaquille O'Neal, Shaquille O'Neal. You know, and of course I'm five eight and Shaquille O'Neal is seven foot. So I don't, you know, but but that's the magnitude of the matter at that particular time, you know, and where the world was, uh, that they saw this black man and their, you know, perceptions and stereotypes are only of athletes uh, in the U.S. and and I'm Shaquille O'Neal. And so, you know, I've, I've moved from Shaquille O'Neal, which is, which is really great. I, I feel like I got a different image now and uh, have moved on from there. But obviously in 2020, Japan still lags behind in terms of its ability to um, understand uh, people of color and, and their position in this world. Um, there certainly have been uh, examples uh, to uh, negate so much of what they believed, and, and not only in Japan, but across the world. But because Japan is such a homogeneous society, even in 2020, it has been something that uh, I've experienced uh, here in, in the land of the rising sun, as they say. But, but I will say things are very different now in terms of um, Japan is obviously, as so many people know, an education-driven society. Uh, they do look to their teachers and see their uh, leaders in administration here as very strong individuals. So if you hold one of those posts, you're considered an exceptional and that transcends race. So I've been lucky in that sense. Um, I've also had the experience that, um, you know, as Connor said, there are very few, um, if any, um, black males in head positions internationally. Uh, in what, eight years ago, I was, uh, I'm the first African-American ever to lead a UWC. Um, and that's interesting, that was just 2013. Um, and I continue to be in this position and, and there usually are no other black males uh, that are in uh, the candidate pool uh, with me. And so in that sense, I become the exception instead of the rule and I'm obviously at times been fortunate because of my blackness in a way to gain that access. Now, for me, I still have to perform. Um, and as Professor Penny, I think said really well, you know, oftentimes, you know, if we're given the position, we have to perform. And if we don't, it, it actually hurts us more than it helps us. And so we have to be careful with that. But, but I've been fortunate and I'm here uh, today by the grace of you know, others who've come before me and who've, who've uh, you know, uh, created the path. And so uh, it's, it's been a, a good run right now. So I'll, I'll end it that, Connor, and, and let you take it back. Thank you, Rod. Well, thank all, all three of you for, uh, for providing those opening remarks, all really interesting comments. Um, this is to, to, the, to the floor, to, to all of you. We, we've obviously deliberately made this event about the obstacles facing the black community, as opposed to any other underrepresented group of which there are many in the international school sector. And I wanted to get your perspective, or ask your perspective on, on what it is that you feel is qualitatively different about the black experience of racial prejudice and discrimination. And is sometimes a focus on diversity in its broader sense, obscuring failures in making progress on black representation? So I don't know whether anybody wants to jump in on that. I think I'll start and I'll be brief in, I mentioned earlier that it is important that we as black people applying for jobs that we gain confidence on who we are. And as Dale said, keep applying and keep applying because eventually um, those doors will open. But I, I think the onus kind of comes down to the recruitment people who don't always necessarily look at you. You and I have had many discussions about the picture on the CV, for example, and I've always said, for me, it's 50-50. When it was what I'm gonna call fashionable, I did put my picture on the CV because I felt many a time I'd gone very far in the process. And then when they actually realized that I was black, things kind of stopped, right? So then I, it was in your face. And then more recently, I haven't bothered because 
as I've matured, I've said to myself, if you don't feel my qualifications are good enough, then it's not even worth my time working um, for your organization. So it's who are the recruiters and what is their brief and how do they support? You've been one of the very few who have actually followed up when organizations have behaved badly. But the recruiters need to be informed and they need to be the cheerleaders so that black people can apply, feel confident that their interests are being taken care of and pushed out there to actually go for it. I'll stop there. Connor, I'll, I'll follow up just with a little bit too. Um, and say, as you mentioned, you know, uh, my background uh, started in, in Nashville, Tennessee, and, and uh, at an HBCU, a historically black college and university at, at Morehouse. Uh, at that particular time, I was um, one of the, that was in the 80s, one of the first ever to use his financial aid uh, to study abroad. And at an HBCU at that particular time, it was unheard of that um, black Americans would, would go abroad. Um, many of you know Dr. Beverly uh, Tatum, who was at the time uh, president of Spelman College, um, who's written many, many uh, famous uh, books. But she talked about, which I think is something that's still relevant today, uh, why black students uh, do not venture abroad. And she talked about the four Fs. And she talked about those in a way um, to explain. And, and I thought they, they're still relevant today. So the four Fs of why black students don't venture abroad start with family. Uh, a real lack of knowledge and understanding from family members what an international experience means. And, and I relate to that so much because when I went home to tell my mother and father that I was going overseas for the first time and I was uh, going to study in England, uh, th there was no way I was going to do that. And my mom said, that I can't take care of you over there. Well, you know, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm in college and university and they still, you know, it's, it's that protective, very, you know, village type mentality that we have as, as, as people of color. And so family became resistant to black students going overseas. Um, obviously, one that's very clear is financial. Uh, financially, uh, you know, the, the money wasn't there. And, and at Morehouse College, again, at, at a prestigious school like that, one of the premier HBCUs that are out there lagged behind in understanding on how to support students to go overseas. Uh, the resources were not as plentiful as we thought about our, our one of our schools in, in Atlanta, Emory University or Georgia Tech. And so you just financially was a struggle. Uh, faculty. Uh, was was another big one uh, that that faculty traditionally never encouraged black students to go overseas because it just wasn't in vogue for them. They they didn't think those students could make it. Uh, traditionally, that was not a path. Uh, there was no interest. Uh, and then the last one, uh, which comes back to family, is fear. Um, as a black student, I I, I just it, it took me a while to think that I could travel overseas. You know, what do you do to get a passport? You know, what, what does that other side look like? You know, do they have hamburgers? Do they have chicken? You know, all those things that come about that you're just scared of. And so, you know, as, as I matured, obviously, and, and took my second stint to Japan and, and returned, all those things have always played into the mentality and the mindset of African-Americans and Black people to travel, and not only African-Americans, but just people of color, throughout the world, whether they reside in Europe or whether they just reside in Asia, those four Fs come up. And I, I, I think it's something that sits with me even still today. Mm -hmm. Dale, did you have anything you wanted to add there? Yes, uh, I'm thinking about what would encourage more black um, people to apply, to go abroad. And, I, and stemming from what Roderick says, I think if you can create cultures that are, are welcoming and comfortable for, for Black people, and even setting up um, sort of organizations within the school that are diverse, and really reaching out to certain populations through the historically Black colleges, uh, through Black media, and uh, links. Um, 
both Persepina and Roddix have talked about the people that have come before them who were supportive, who are allies and, and companies such as the ones you work for and other recruiting or organizations can put people in touch with others who have done it and provide mentoring and coaching and support for individuals, even exploratory conversations. I, I think that is really important to, to lower the effective filter to allow people to be more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dale. I thank you, everyone. And, and a, a question that kind of I was thinking of as we were talking there, and it's you mentioned a bit in the chat here as well, is just this, this question of the, the, the pipeline of black talent in the international education sector. Um, Rod, you, you and I talked a bit about, you've, you've been pretty successful at recruiting for diversity at your school. You've, you've taken a very purposeful approach and you've achieved uh, di an interesting and diverse mix among your faculty. And I think the, the excuse that's often thrown out is that they're just, the, the pool is too shallow. There, there aren't, you know, black educators in the international sector just aren't there. And so my, my question was, from your guys' experience um, recruiting, is there a pipeline issue? And, and are you noticing it's improving over time in recent years? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's obvious to say there is, there is a lack of, of um, direct recruitment just because, again, of the things that all three of us have talked about. I mean, it's just, it, it, there, there's, there are barriers there. And I also believe that there are ways to overcome those barriers. And I think you have to develop like anything else, systems that allow for growth, mentorship, uh, guidance, uh, and, and, and starting young and, and using resources in a way that you're not expecting overnight success. And, and I think that that's a real challenge for most schools. They're, they're looking for uh, the golden boy or golden girl and not realizing, you know, we're putting our resources in professional development for these young people that we recruit. We're putting our resources in, you know, making sure their transition to the schools and colleges that uh, they're going to are, have the access that's needed and they're treated well. And, and I, I, I think sometimes, you know, schools try to do more than they need to. Uh, that, that people of color, or just like any other people, they, they want things done well, right, and, and accurate. And, and if you can do that, 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 that's most important. And also they want genuine people to be around. And I think that uh, sometimes that is lost in the whole thing. There's too much, um, as they say, there are more bells and whistles than needed to be there. But um, yeah, creating a, a younger uh, group and, and working with them and, and providing a track. I'd like to jump in and mention the intention, but also the passport barrier that us Africans have had in trying to work in other parts of the world. And so it will be, oh, don't you have another passport, which is insulting enough. <laughs> but, you know, these are the, <laughs> these are the dumb things that come um, our way. But to go back to your piece on the pool of people, and Dale mentioned something there, a bit on as school leaders, as black school leaders in international education, one of our responsibilities has been to network, has been to look out and support others who look like us. And I've also been recruiting and just sometimes giving teachers that experience to actually interview, even if that's not the role you're looking for. This is how we grow. So we've had that other responsibility as well. And I pride myself in having mentored other black people into leadership roles in their areas, head of department or whatever. But my mentoring also has been across the board. But I think when the intention is there to bring people on board where you are supporting, you are coaching, you, you are using that network. I'm looking for a person to add value to my school that looks like most of the kids in my school, for example. So we, we do have a responsibility in keeping those conversations going and developing, yes, when I started 
in international education 25 years ago, more and more, I was a minority and for a long time, either as a teacher or a school principal, I was a minority. I went into the IB and I was still an amazing minority. But what's been exciting is that there has been a shift. So the pool has grown and there are more and more people of color applying, but we have to grow that because it's a process. It hasn't stopped. And there are more young people, as Rod says with the four Fs, there are more young people who are adventurers who are trying. And it's so sad that so many get it rejected for the wrong reasons, but we have to keep the conversation going because they are out there and they do want to experience and they do want to share their cultures in international schools. You know, that's what we, the philosophy, that's what we're preaching every day. So let's keep doing it because we're growing. We are growing out there. Connor, I want to talk and to everybody, I, I want to mention something specific that uh, recruitment companies can do, schools can do, and that is to be really cognizant of who you send out to recruit in these recruitment fairs. Who you send matters. And if it's a, a panel of all Caucasian males, that you are going to be received differently than if that panel is diverse. It's a question of practicing what you're espousing or what we want to aspire to in terms of diversity. And when I think back about my recruiting experience and when um, I, I recruited in the States at one of the large fairs and there was me and another colleague who went and I think it was because of the way I looked and be because people could identify with that, we had a lot of people line up in front of our table. They may not have necessarily wanted a specific job with us, but they felt something that they could recognize and can ask questions and mm -hmm. begin that conversation and gather advice. It wasn't just about trying to um, you know, capture somebody for an English position or something else. So many other conversations went on in that space. And I think that's a really, really important space. And I was really encouraged to see so many people of color, so many women of color come up to the table. Mm -hmm. And I think those part goes back to that welcoming environment and seeing themselves reflected. Are there ways in which implicit bias does, em does emerge and has emerged in your experience in those face-to-face -face interviews? Are there sort of forms of question that can, um, you know, where implicit bias is perhaps encoded um, without maybe the, you know, the knowledge or intention of the person that's asking the questions? I, I can't think of a specific example, but when they're talking about schools that you've attended and the more familiar they are with the educational institutions and the more um, sort of status those institutions have, the more they will take you seriously. And, and I'll be honest, McGill is a real cachet when mm -hmm. I was younger and starting out. But if people don't have that experience, that could possibly be a bias. Well, uh, oh, go ahead, Prosperini. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say one, one question that really irritates me is why should we hire you? I just find it degrading, and you're sitting there as a black person knowing you're already at a disadvantage, and all these Caucasian people are looking at you. For me, it's almost time to get up and leave. You know, it's like, all righty, we're not going there, we're not playing that game unacceptable and I say this because I have had recruiters reach out to me for certain jobs and I just say are they ready to recruit black strong women mm -hmm. from the first day because otherwise I'm investing my precious time that I'm never going to get back and the organization never intended to even consider me so there are some questions which I find are not always asked to everyone Mm. just to make you feel uncomfortable and I think that's just unacceptable behavior and totally totally unnecessary. Sure. Rob did you want to jump in? 
I was just going to comment uh, a second on uh, one of the questions in the chat is, uh, you know, what, what are some of the dynamics in place uh, that work for you uh, at your school? And, and one of the things I would say for me, at least, it was the idea that um, the position I was applying for was a founding head of school. And I think that idea that the board uh, was looking to begin a school and was much more willing and able to uh, look at a young, you know, African American who had experience in independent schools in the U.S. You know, as as Dale said, I, I was fortunate to you know attend Morehouse College, HBCU, with you know a, a real long legacy of of producing you know strong black males, and and being able to say that actually you know I had been to Japan, uh, and I think those things played in my favor. So the dynamics set up for them to say, let's do this. Let's do something that doesn't look like it should fit. You know, who hires this African-American male out of the Southern part of the U.S. with uh, a, a speaking Japanese with a Southern accent? That just doesn't happen. And it can't happen. Why not do it? So those dynamics played in my, in my favor at that particular time. That, I, I love that question. Does, does any Dale and Proserpina? I guess the, the question was, um, what are, what were the dynamics in place at the schools where you have worked and led that, that made you want to be there as a, as a person of color? Well, for me, when when I look at um, I look at the specific dynamics going on in the school and the, the ethos, the mission, and not only that, is is the feel of the school. And for Turkey, it was just such a dynamic, progressive place where students were, were um, they had a board in charge of IT development and the students were on the board. So I, I look at the progressive nature. I look at, again, how open and welcoming they are to, for people of different races, people of different nationalities. And I know today we're talking about black people, but I've had um, t teachers who I've hired said they had a hard time getting hired because they were from France, from um, Portugal. Uh, again, we need to widen and open that gate up to so many more people, black people and other nationalities as well. So schools who are willing and open to different nationalities and welcoming, I take a look at and have very strong um, internationalist ideas um, about peace, about service. Those are the schools that interest me. And again, I am not going to push where it's difficult or push where it's so hard. And schools that are resistance and, and have a monoculture and want to retain that, it doesn't make sense for me to approach those schools. In the three schools that I've been principal or assistant principal, it had, for me, it was about the IB and the IB philosophy. In Germany, it was an all-program, IB program school, and I was the minority, and I think there was one black family there as well. But in all the schools that I've been at, it's interesting, the phases, what I call the phases of acceptance. So you arrive because someone has hired you, you have a job to do, there's an attitude towards you, and until you do what um, Roderick also said earlier, until you perform because you're hired to do a job, but until you do your job and then people take a U-turn and come back and start giving you the respect. But I think our journey to earn the respect is probably a bit longer, but I know I, enjoy, I enjoyed my stunts in all these schools. I still have teachers, I mentor teachers who reach out to me all excited telling me what's happening in their lives and teachers across the school as well because we call it Ubuntu where I come from and it's just humility. Hmm? It's empathy and humility and treating others like you would like to be treated yourself. So you come with your value system and then that comes in your leadership and then you're successful on the journey and I think that's the core which is important for me as well. So IB school's important, a history of being diverse and international, but sometimes the culture is quite monocultural 
but you're coming to add value. You're coming to bring something that's different. And then the community learns who you are, and then they want to learn from you and with you, which I think makes the difference there. Thank you. Um, we talked a bit earlier about the idea of the, who you send out to recruitment fairs to recruit your faculty and how that can have such an impact on who approaches your stand. Um, but thinking about leadership search, so you, you've all been involved in the sorts of executive searches that firms like mine run. Um, and obviously we, we have a serious representation issue in terms of leadership. And, and I wondered, um, reflecting on that process, the typical executive search process, are there elements that just, um, you know, we need to be thinking differently about when it comes to trying to attract people of colour into the process, but then making sure they go all the way? Um, I wonder if you've given this any, any thought. I've thought about it, and I think the onus is on the recruitment companies in talking to their clients about this, because I, I think you as recruiters do have a lot of power that the individuals might not have, you know, in stating what your, your policies, practices are, and maybe in stating some anti-discriminatory uh, policies and possibly refuse to work with particular schools who do discriminate based on um, whether or not somebody is a native English speaker or people of color and, and have those honest conversations with them. I, I think um, it, this, this is a hard one to challenge, especially when the, the default bias is uh, for a certain type and look to head a school. And, and yes, this is you know, one of the most important positions in the school and people are going to look at that carefully, but I do think people have blinders on as to who can actually lead and what sort of image they want to project. And that absolutely needs to be challenged. Thank you, Dale. Rod and Prosopina, was there anything you wanted to add there? The, the intention, and we have spoken a lot about this, uh, when you do reach out to someone as a recruitment firm, what is your intention? Is it to tick a box to say you have come up with these clients or are you supporting um, the candidates, sorry, or are you supporting them all the way? And honesty, and honesty, because I think we are, it's 2020, which is wonderful. We are at a place now where as you approach us, we hit you back with some tough questions so that we know it's a fit or it's not a fit. And then we don't have to waste each other's times. But talking to your client and saying, fine, we do this, we believe, here's our value system. And this is what we do. So if we're going to work for you, and I like what Dale said, reject them if it's not fitting with what is your mission and what is your intention. And if that's strong enough, I think those clients will eventually come back because change is taking place. Might be so, but it is taking place. But be honest, be honest and don't do it for the wrong reasons. Get people involved because you want them to be successful in the journey of the recruitment. Thank you. Um, I want to be mindful of any questions that are coming through the chat and, and we have had one here that I wonder if anyone wanted to speak to just around if you're looking at a school and there is no diversity in, in leadership and there isn't necessarily a history of diversity there, should you as a person of colour even bother to apply? Most definitely. I agree. That's how totally change agree. takes place. <laughs> We wouldn't be here, Connor. We wouldn't all be sitting here and having this discussion if we hadn't done that. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've had people say, how did you get the job? And I said, I like Grud's four Fs, but <laughs> with all that, how did you get the job? I dared to apply. It's that simple, you know? And mm -hmm. then you do your homework, et cetera, et cetera. People might not all look like you, but we know that in international education, Overall, most schools will have children that look like us as well. And how wonderful for that child to have a role model that will inspire them to do great things in their lives as well. And if they don't have those Caucasian or whatever other cultures also get to experience 
something awesome and the shift, the mind shift of those children and black people can be leaders, black people can make a difference in their lives. It's, it's a story just being there. And I think it's important to find the right fit, but not delete a school just because it has people that don't look like you. We're there to inspire and to encourage. I, I would piggyback that and, and say two, two quick examples for me are that um, the, the school I started at uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, a, a school called Montgomery Bell Academy, uh, all boys school that was founded in 1867. And that date is significant for all of you historians. Um, in 1996, I was only the third African-American ever hired at that school. Amazingly enough, I, I knew the school very well. Uh, and um, had one of the um, students come up to me and said, uh, you know, Mr. Jimerson, you're the first black person I've ever had to call Mr. And, wow. and again, that's, that's in 1996. So um, it's, and, and I was heavily criticized at that particular time by my community for going to that school because why are you there? They have everything you should go back to your local community. You graduated from HBCU. You're taking your talents to a school that doesn't even need you. And, and my uh, comment was to them, actually, they probably need me even more uh, because those students, those white students need, and parents need an example and, and are able to respect and, and, and say things to me that they wouldn't ever say to anybody else. And, and that was very important in my particular career to go through that experience. I think the other thing, and I'll go back a little bit and, and make this short too, you know, going to an HBCU, and I came from a family of uh, parents who went to HBCUs. Uh, my my uh, dad uh, went to Morehouse for a couple of years, but eventually graduated from Alabama and m my mother graduated from Fisk University, which is located in Nashville, Tennessee. But, but the one thing I can say about my experience at HBCUs, and I had, uh, prior to that, uh, my upbringing were in Catholic schools, believe it or not, again, in Nashville, Tennessee, where I was the only African American oftentimes. What the HBCU experience, especially at Morehouse, did to me was it, it took away for me personally, the excuse of race that I could use throughout my life. And so what eventually happened is when I was at Morehouse, my competitiveness was against everyone who looked like me. And it was very unique. So I had to own my failures and could not use race at that particular time as an excuse. And so as I've gone through my life, I'm taking race out of the play for anyone to tell me it was about race. So you're not gonna, I, I'm not gonna allow you to say, I didn't get the job because of my race. I'm gonna force you to say, there's something I need to work on, I need to get better. And that's very unique because what I don't want anyone to do is have that in their pocket. I, I want them to take, I'm not letting, if you say, right, you, you didn't get it because you were black. No, I, I, that, that's not the right reason you know so I, I play on that a lot i know that's very unique and different and i know so many of my colleagues that's not the way that their experience was that, that they didn't get the job because they were black uh they they didn't get the job because they were black and female which i think dale and prosopenia your experiences are so different from mine so unique i would say that their challenges Dale and Prospenia are much higher of a ladder to climb, uh, much more unique, and I think, uh, again, much more challenging than anything that I've experienced thus far. So real kudos to the two of you as, as black females and, and what you're doing in this world. Thank you. Okay. Thank you Can I just that jump up. in, Connor, really quickly? Of, of course. I just got a message which I think is important. And what exactly, um, what we've just finished talking about being a minority. I think as people of color going out there and looking for international jobs all over the world, that recruitment with that head of school, I think is very important. You need to feel that this is the person who's gonna hire you. And no matter if others reject you in the school, they should support you. Hmm? And Whatever happens, they're with you on, on the way. They shouldn't be ticking a box because then you are a token and this person will be far away from home and suffer 
emotional stress, et cetera, et cetera. So really get that right strong feeling and have the conversation when I'm in your school, will there be others like me? If not, what kind of programs are you running to inform your teachers, your students about people of color and how to be inclusive, et cetera, et cetera. So just a little side piece, which I think is important because it's one thing to get the job and get excited, but when you're there, you have to soar and develop and be happy. And if you're not, then it's not the right job for you. Yeah. Thank you, Estelle. Yeah, I want to piggyback on what Praspina said about the importance of not limiting ourselves. And I've reflected on the, the idea that even though you don't see yourself in a particular school or particular values, if they are open enough to hire you, I would say go with it because mm -hmm. your presence there will have an incredible impact on that learning community. On other well, you do need uh, courage to do that. You are being an incredible risk taker. And so you will also need support networks to get you through an incredible self care in, in order to make that work. Thank you so can, much. You know, can, excuse me, Connor, can I add just one more thing? And, and I would just again piggybacking on, on both what Dale and Parspinia said, I would also say. I do feel a tremendous amount of responsibility uh, to walk the walk and talk the talk. And I'm always on internationally, yep. more so than I'd ever would be in the US. Because I know, as, as I think about Michael Jordan when he said, you know, I try to make sure when I play the game, because I know there's only that kid may only have one time to see me play. I have to put on the best show I can. And that's what we have to do as people of color in the international circuit. Because so many times we're the only one, this is the only time this student or this parent is gonna see us and we better be performing at the highest level. We don't have the time or excuse to make mistakes. And that's a tremendous responsibility that I think is underscored in our experience internationally. Uh, it, 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 is, it, is, it is pressure, it is responsibility, uh, and, and we must come through. Um, because we know if we don't, nobody comes behind us. Yeah. Well said. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts today. Guys. There's so much that we could cover. I could go on talking for hours, but I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, as, as a parting comment, I mean, we talked before about um, separately, the, the four of us, about any bits of um, advice when it comes to reading or, or things you've listened to or watched recently that you think might be useful takeaways for anyone. No pressure, but is there, if, Rod, you've mentioned Beverly Tatum's work, which is um, something I've, I've noted, but any other suggestions? Um, well, I'm sorry. I, I'm just I'm familiar with the Association of International Educators and Leaders of Color. I yes. think that's a good place for, for people to start. I think um, the International Educator Magazine, um, for people the least bit interested in international education, to take a look there. Lisa Delpit's book, in terms of pedagogy on other people's children, is, is a wonderful start. Also, there's another organization, um, a group that we've left out uh, are the gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual people. And Gleason is a wonderful education organization that works to end harassment and bullying of, of a particular population as well. So I don't think people might be familiar with those, so that's why I mentioned those specifically. Thank you, Dale. There's the Think Diversity Collaborative. And I Absolutely. see there's some members that I've seen there, which they have great resources that have helped me through my journey. And yeah, um, Kevin Simpson's work is phenomenal across the board. Everything his organization is doing in including and giving voice to people is just wow. And I encourage everyone to have a look at it and um, grow grow yeah. and have the tools to develop your schools further but also teachers you know the professional development we talk about life lifelong learning 
it's teachers, students, parents, recruitment agencies, you know, we all have a job to keep informing, but to also keep learning with each other and from each other. Right. And I'll echo that with Kevin Simpson. Thank you so much, Kevin, for your support in promoting this as well. Well, guys, we'll end there, but thank you all very, very much for joining, and I hope we do this again sometime soon. Thank you. Have Honor wonderful mornings, days, evenings. Appreciate it. And thank you, thank everyone, you everyone, for coming and joining us. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.